Welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight for this virtual U Miami Health Talk, Contemporary Issues in Men's Health, What You Need to Know. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Segreto, and I am honored to be your moderator for this evening's U Miami Health Talk presented by U Health's Desai Sete Urology Institute. Desai Sete Urology Institute's mission is to deliver excellence in clinical care, to improve patient care through cutting edge research and to empower the next generation of urologists. They've assembled the largest group of fellowship trained subspecialty leaders in the region. And many of these experts have been recruited from first class institutions and have been sought after both nationally and globally. These clinicians have a proven track record of excellence in clinical care, catering to individual needs and following the time tested adage of treating each patient like they were family. We invite you to learn more about the Desai Seti Urology Institute by visiting umiamihealth.org. You can also, if you're old school here, you can make an appointment just by using the phone. You can call 305-243-6090. Now, in honor of Men's Health Month, tonight we're going to hear from urology expert Dr. Bruce Kaba speaking on the contemporary issues in men's health. Dr. Kava's presentation will address gender disparities in health conditions, why cancer screenings are so vital, and male sexual problems, and much more. And at the end of the session of this evening's presentation, there's going to be a Q&A session, and Dr. Kava will answer all of the questions that many of you submitted over the past week. Now, here's something special. If you didn't submit a question in advance, don't worry, because you can still ask a question live during our presentation. All you have to do, and it's really simple, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A feature. With that feature, send us your question. We wanna remind you that every question is anonymous and we promise we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Bruce Kava. Dr. Kava is the Director of Men's Health at the Desai Seti Urology Institute and a professor of urology in the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He's been with the Miller School for 22 years. He's a bona fide expert in men's health. Dr. Kava has particular expertise in urologic oncology, sexual dysfunction, and BPH. He's authored numerous peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, as well as a chapter on essential communication skills for urologists for the American Urological Association core curriculum. He is currently president-elect of the American Society of Men's Health and has served on the editorial board of the Journal of Sexual Medicine and the board of directors for the Florida Urological Association. Now, Dr. Kava, as I bring you in, not to embarrass you, sir, but if there were a Mount Rushmore of urological doctors and men's health specialists and experts, it would be you. You would be leading off that Mount Rushmore. So we welcome you. We're honored to have you. I don't know when you have time to sleep, and yet you still fit us in this evening. Welcome. Thank you so much, Tony. Can, can you guys see me okay? Great, yes. perfect. So Mount Rushmore, I'm not that old, okay? <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to be able to talk to you guys about some contemporary issues in men's health. Uh, unfortunately, we had a little problem with technical stuff at the last minute, so I'm not controlling my slides. I'm gonna, during the course of the, the, the discussion, I'm gonna ask to forward the slides and so, um, I'm, uh, Laura is going to be nice enough to be do, doing that for us. So let's go with the first slide, Laura, please. All right, great. So as we see in this slide, basically, there is clearly a need for gender-based medicine to be practiced. The differences between men and women are not limited to just uh, anatomical differences. Men and women seek healthcare treatment and care in different manners. Females are much more likely to seek out or seek medical care for high blood pressure, back pain, diabetes, osteoporosis. Men just aren't trained to do that. We, can, we tend to rationalize medical conditions that we have and equate them with physical fitness. We, I see it often, I see a guy going to the gym and working out and lifting excessive amounts of weights and then he'll go out and smoke in the, in the hallway afterwards to just, just to relax afterwards. Or he'll go out and eat a, eat a big meal, you know, fatty meal afterwards. But men's health is more than just physical fitness. 
And the men's perspective on this is a lot different as well. Men tend, by, by equating phys physical health with physical fitness, we tend to rationalize things. And actually there are, there are delays as, as a result of this, particularly, and we see it in neurology all the time. People come to us with delays in, in a, a testicular tumor that they've had for, for months or even years that have, has grown slowly, but they, they rationalize and said, oh, well, I thought it would go away. So these are the things that we deal with in men's health. And that's why I think there is a definite need for gender-based a gender-based lens on this. Next slide, please. Laura, thank you. This is actually the the whole the whole notion of how we see how we seek and utilize our healthcare in in on one slide, and this slide shows us that up to at, at age ten, the the number of healthcare visits, and this is this is data from the United Kingdom, the number of healthcare visits entailed by by women is much more than men between the ages of 10 to around 60. Those are the ages that men are primarily working, they're feeling fit, they're feeling healthy, they don't go to the doctors. Women do go to doctors for pregnancy and reproductive issues, but they don't tend, they often will go for other reasons as well. And so this lack of utilization of healthcare services between those critical years when things are forming in our bodies and diseases are starting is we believe is, is the, the basic problem for, for, male, for men's health. Next slide, please. Next slide. Great. It applies to, to, uh, to cancer screens as well. Men are very reluctant to go for cancer screenings, um, particularly, and, and we'll talk a little bit in a little while about specific cancers, but the colorectal skin, lung cancer, and prostate cancer are the big ones that we'll be discussing, and men tend to fall short and getting their cancer screenings. You don't see a lot of women not going for mammographies, but men tend to try to avoid those prostate exams or the, the uncomfortable feeling of having a, having a colonoscopy. Next slide, please. Life expectancy is bir at birth is really a gauge of overall population health. And we can see that the end result of all this is that women tend to live about five years longer than men do. Men die five years earlier. That's not only true for Europe, but the United States as well. Next slide. I'm gonna show you a bunch of different slides right now. We're gonna go through them fairly quickly because I, I just want you to get a gestalt for, for what we're dealing with as, as men's health experts. So when we talk about the life expectancy for men, well, how do we figure that out? How do we figure out why men die earlier? So we have to know the causes of death and it varies based upon the age. In the older age group, and I'm not very old, but 65 or older, the majority of deaths in men are as a result of cancer and heart disease. But if you go down and look at, at the ages 40 to 50, 30 to 40, there's, an ink, there's less heart disease, less cancer-related deaths, but significant number of accidental injuries, suicide, homicide. These are things that are fully preventable. Next slide, please. And in fact, some of the researchers have looked at this and, and shown that the majority of causes of death for men and women are, are pretty preventable if, we, if, we, if our lifestyles were a little bit different, if we ate better, if we didn't smoke, if we exercised more often, if we avoided fatty foods, if we avoided obesity. These are things that, that a lot of the deaths in, in males in particular are, are attributed to. Heart disease is, is something that's been on the decline for the last 25, 30 years. That's significant, but still men are lagging behind women as far as the number of heart disease. In fact, 40% of men will die during their first heart attack. They probably had a warning sign, they probably rationalized it, and they probably didn't do anything about it. Next slide. Obesity, we've done a great job. Well, the, the number of obese men in the United States now is 30%. Next slide. This is very interesting. This is Forbes magazine. Every year they publish the deadliest jobs in America. It's kind of interesting, kind of fun in a way, but this is really bad. We, we tend to take a lot of risks and some of that can be attributed certainly to the, to the uh, industry, and, and protections against, against harmful problems related to the, to the work that we do. 
but also so men tend to take the dead, they take to logging, for instance, uh, even, even uh, the people who work on, on, uh, on san sanitation workers. If you look at the lower left-hand screen, part of the screen here, there's a gentleman up on a roof there with no harness or anything. And I thought that this was interesting until I saw it across the street from my own house. Next slide. This, this is a picture I took out of my window. And if you look at, and there's a little circle that I've next, just hit the advanced button. There's a little guy up there on his roof. What he's doing on his roof, fixing a tile, we shouldn't be doing that. There's no harness, there's no protection against falling and men fall and roofing is actually one of the, one of the deadliest jobs out there now. Next slide, please. Next slide. Suicide, unfortunately, has reached uh, terrible proportions now. 45,000 people in America die from suicide each year. Three to one men commit suicide over women. And, you know, the, actually, they, they, you scrolled forward a little bit too quickly there, but uh, the, the numbers are on the, on the rise at this point in every single state in the United States, with the exception of Nevada. This is, this is a very sad situation here. Suicide, and, and most of these people don't have a history of mental illness that we know about. Uh, a lot of them are veterans. I, I just went to a, a, a veteran uh, association meeting, and actually the, this is a very big problem for, for veterans coming back from, from a variety of different wars and, and, uh, and missions on the outside. Next slide. I, brought, I put this up because it's. I used to think that suicide was really a, a, a problem for for people middle age, but we're talking the, the majority of suicides are actually caused and are performed by men 75 and older. Next slide. This is a very interesting concept that uh, that was sponsored by some of the leading male grooming products, Unilever Axe and uh, Promundo. And they did some, some surveys. Men are three to six times more likely to make unwanted sexual comments about women three to seven times more likely to, to use physical violence, two times as likely to have suicidal thoughts, and two to four times as likely as of having, uh, re refraining from some activities as, as it may feel, it, it makes them uh, appear gay in the, in the United States and the United Kingdom. They call this the man box, and I think it's a very interesting uh, concept. Um, I think that we, we, there's got to be a lot more work that we do on this, but, but raising our kids in a way that, that they're not in a man box is, is something that, that uh, is very desirable at this point and much needed. Next slide. All the data that I just presented you, to you um, was, uh, was very interesting data, but this, is, this hits home. This is a study that I did with a medical student here at the University of Miami. We looked, we, we worked with the uh, public health department, the state of Florida. We developed a state of Florida men's health report. We found again, every single item on that list that I showed you before related to the CDC's data applies to the Flor Floridians as well. In Florida, we have 49% of, of the population is male. There's about a five year life expectancy gap between men and women. Next slide. If you go down the list in men who are 18 to 34 years old, 50% of the deaths are attributable to accidental injuries. That is, that is really telling. Those are young men and people who are, who are 34, 35 to 54 also. Homicide is very big, a very big cause of death in these groups too, as well as suicide. So, I think that with this data in mind, we need to go to our, to our schools and education systems and start looking at this a little bit more closely, how we can ingrain in, in men, to how to avoid these accidental injuries, how to live healthier lifestyles, avoid taking risks. This would save a lot of lives each year. Next slide, please. We tend not to wear seatbelts. We tend to smoke. We tend to vape. We, we, a lot of us are sedentary. And, and there's still a, a tremendous number of people who are abusing alcohol. Next slide, please. This is all data that we got from the public health department in the state of Florida, which is fantastic. And eventually we will hopefully, once this is published, we'll be able to go to the state and say, listen, this is the data, we need to work on this. Next slide, please. In, uh, so again, we talked about cancer screenings. 
30% of men have never had a colonoscopy in the, in the age group over 50. And 40% uh, and of men over 50 have never had a PSA test for screening for prostate cancer. Those numbers are staggering. Next slide, please. So I think that when you look at these mortality disparities, uh, men have less access to and engage less with healthcare systems uh, than, than their female counterparts do. Males are typically employed in more dangerous occupations and they're raised with risk-taking and masculine social constructs, which I think that we need to start working on. And it, it, the, the time is now, really. We need to move forward on this because this is the data. We have it now on paper. This is absolute data that we've gotten from various sources. And uh, this is, and, and now we have to come up with some solutions to this. Next slide. When we look across the, the United States, and actually I, I do this often, I'll, I'll, they took some of the slides out from my deck, but what I'll do is I'll Google men's health centers. And if you go across men's health centers in the state of Florida, you'll find about 30 or 40 uh, web related uh, activities on there showing men's health centers. And the majority of these health centers in, in, uh, on, on the internet or through Google are, are related to sexual health. I think that health is a little bit, more, and that's one of the things, one of our goals here at the University of Miami is to provide more complete physical, mental, and social well being, not merely the absence of, absence of disease and infirmity, and not focusing solely on sexual health. As a urologist, clearly a lot of my interest is below the waist, but there's a lot more to it than that. And that's, that's one thing that, that we have at the University of Miami that this sense of collaboration and mission to work with others in a multidisciplinary approach towards men's health. Next slide. I'm gonna go to the next slide, slide after that. This will become apparent in a second. So one of the things I did wanna talk a little bit about was cancer screenings. Again, men tend not to go for cancer screenings as, as often as their, the female counterparts too, do. And I think that the data is fairly clear right now on, on cancer screenings and cancer screenings clearly, and the ones that we'll mention here today, they clearly save lives. Next, next slide, please. This is uh, basically the, the, the mortality rates associated with a variety of cancers through the years and through the decades. Uh, and the top graph that we see up there is, is lung cancer incidents and, and death, death from lung cancer. And that's gone down tremendously since, uh, since about uh, 1990. 1990, we, we started doing, CAT scans became available. Low-dose CTs, where low-dose CAT scans of the chest were available at that time. Cigarette smoking and tobacco abuse, they started to decline at that time. We've taken a tremendous number of actions against uh, that, that would impact the number of cases of lung cancer each year. So when we talk about primary prevention, it's, it's smoking cessation, earlier detection with, with low-dose CT, and, and more effective treatment options. Colorectal cancer, since the 19... Uh, late 1970s. I remember uh, um, seeing this on, on, on uh, Tony, I, I, I don't know if, um, if she was down here. Um, I forgot the reporter's name, but she basically went on and, and had her colonoscopy on TV. And, and basically that, that saved lives because men started realizing um, how, in fact, that um, colonoscopies can detect cancers earlier. And as a result of that, we've dropped the risk, the rate of uh, colorectal cancer mortality by 55%. So early detection has saved lives here. And then we talk about prostate cancer with the PSA screening tests that we've that have been developed since the 1980s. We've seen a 53% drop in mortality since uh, since PSA screening started. Next slide, please. This is just a graph showing how we've saved over 2.7 million lives as a result of these screening opportunities the trajectory toward, was towards the, uh, the red line up there. And as a result, we mitigated that, that, uh, that trajectory to the blue line. Next, next slide, please. Just showing again, colorectal cancer, when detected early, 91% of men are cured, when not, 38% are cured. As a result of this, there are some high-risk population groups, and we need to recognize those people. But as a result of this, the, the data showing clear benefits to colorectal cancer screening, and mostly colonoscopy, in, in all honesty, mostly through colonoscopy, the, the 
recommendations now have been have moved the dial. Now we're starting to recommend that men get screened with colonoscopies at age 45 rather than 50, because the benefits are clearly there. Next slide. A variety of, um, of different um, gender uh, risks. Gender risk certainly comes into the risk of colorectal cancer. Men develop colorectal cancer at a higher rate than women do. Uh, African-American males have a higher risk of colorectal cancer. Next slide. And we could see on the, on the right-hand side of the screen here that if you're not insured, the risk of colorectal cancer is, uh, it goes up that, that it's not detected. And so the, the cure rates for colorectal cancer are less with, with uninsured people as a result of not getting these screening opportunities. Next slide. So these are the current recommendations from the US Preventative Service Task Force that, that colon, the uh, US Preventative Task Force recommends screening for colorectal cancer. And there are a variety of different screening techniques. I, I tend to favor colonoscopies, but uh, there, there are other there are stool based uh, uh, studies, DNA studies, things like that, that can be done as well. You see, you've heard about Cologuard in the, on the news and on, on the TV. But uh, I, I think the colonoscopy certainly is, is far and away the, the best opportunity to, to catch these lesions early. And they're recommending now with level A uh, evidence that uh, 50 to 75 year old men should be screened. Um, for men in the 45 to 49 year range, the, the dial has really moved towards this with level B evidence. And uh, again, the, I think that this is really, this, this is fantastic data uh, that's driven this and, and really has shown that we saved lives as a result of the colorectal cancer screening. Next, part, next slide, please. Lung cancer, many men don't know about this, but if they've had a history of smoking uh, in the past, 20 pack years at least, and they're age 50 to 80, then they do recommend annual low dose CT screening for lung cancer. And that would be uh, up until about 15 years after you've stopped smoking. This has been proven also to save lives. When we detect these lesions late, it's, it's very, very rarely are we able to cure men. Uh, and, and chest x-rays are certainly not enough to detect most of the lesions. Low dose CT is where it's at. And, and again, the data suggests that uh, two separate studies have shown that there's significant improvement in life expectancy as a result of this. Next, next slide. Prostate cancer is a little more tricky. So there are two major clinical trials looking at screening for prostate cancer using the PSA test. This is the PLCO trial, which is prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer screening trials where they showed that at, uh, at 10 years, there was no difference in survival in men who were screened for prostate cancer versus those that the control group that didn't have the PSA test. The problem with this study was that more, more than 50% of the people in the control group who should not have gotten a PSA test did actually get a PSA somehow. And there were more biopsies performed in the control group than there were in the screening group. So this is tremendous, tremendous amount of bias in this study, which basically showed no difference in survival. And, and as a result of this trial in particular, the uh, US Preventative Task Force came out with a recommendation statement saying that, that PSA screening did no good and that men shouldn't have a routine surveillance PSA screening. Next slide, please. This is another study. This is the second study, the major study on this, European randomized study, looking at PSA screening versus no screening. And again, there was a heavy influence of, in the control group, many of the patients did get, PSA is a simple blood test. So many of the patients in the control group here did get, a, get the blood test done anyway. But even with, with that, there, at uh, 10 to 15 years after screening, there was clearly a survival advantage for those men who had the PSA screening test done. Next slide. So at this point, with these questions and concerns about the data out there and some potential bias, the US Preventative Task Force gave PSA, routine PSA screening a level C, which means that it should, it's a shared decision between the doctor and the patient. The patient is given the, it, when, we, when we recommend PSA screening to somebody or discuss PSA screening, we basically offer it to them. We discuss the PSA test, what its value is, how it can pro detect prostate cancer early, but there are people that are detected too early. If you live long enough, 
Most people eventually will develop some prostate cancer. Most of these in, are indolent lesions. Many are not though. So the PSA test helps us identify those patients that, that, that uh, have more aggressive forms of disease at younger ages. But this is a discussion. At least we, we got the level C, which means there's a discussion between the doctor and the patient. Next slide. So these are the current cancer screening guidelines. 25 to 39 for men and women, basically cervical cancer screening is the only thing that, that can be recommended at this point. We talk about skin cancer screening. There's not a lot of value that's been demonstrable, but we know that, that going to a dermatologist, particularly since we live in the state of Florida, we're exposed to, to the sunlight and, and uh, UV light, melanoma screening is, is very important. So I, I still recommend that even for that young age group age 40 to 49 screening recommendations, breast cancer certainly for, breast cancer and cervical cancer for women, but for men, we still, uh, we still talk about colorectal cancer screening. And for those men who are at high, higher risk for prostate cancer, such as African-American males or males with a family history, we'll talk about prostate, PSA screening in that group. And then age 50 and, 50 and older, PSA screening, colorectal cancer screening, and lung cancer screening for those men who, who uh, uh, who are former smokers who are at increased risk for developing lung cancer should be done. Next, Mary, next slide, please. Well, I decided to bring in a couple of topics at this point because men's health, we talked primarily about cancer screenings and some, some disparities in, in men's health issues, but let's get down to some of the nitty gritty in, in urology in particular and, and men's health and urology go hand in hand. So this is Mervyn. And he's, he's in bed lying, lying there. He's late. At, it's late at night. He just got back from the bathroom. What's he thinking about? What more, most ordinary guys think about when they're waking up at two o'clock in the morning to go to, go to the bathroom again. Next, next slide, please. He's, thought, he's thinking about his prostate. So his prostate's been growing. That prostate's been growing in him since age 30. Next slide, please. And it's finally taking its toll. So what is a prostate? A lot of guys don't even know what the prostate does. And if you ask me as a urologist, after four, close to 40 years in the field, I still find it hard to explain what exactly the prostate does. It's, it's an organ that, that does a lot, of, lot of stuff for us when we're in our reproductive years. It, it produces some fluid, it's acid rich, it's got fructose, which feeds the sperm. It provides nutrients, enzymes that, that break down the, the uh, ejaculate fluid so that, it, that in, in order to impregnate or, or fertilization for, for the egg. But beyond that, after reproductive years, the prostate really doesn't do much except cause problems for us, okay? So it grows, and we can see on the right-hand side of the screen how it grows, and it pr produces some pressure around the bladder neck and, and, the, and it, the outlet of the bladder, making it more difficult for men to, to urinate. This process starts at age 30. Next slide, please. This is the, in, the prevalence of histologic PPH. If you do a biopsy on men's prostates, you could see at age 30 is when you start seeing the changes occur. But the bladder is, amaz is an amazing organ. And again, I, this, I've dedicated my life to the study of these things because I found them fascinating. The prostate grows and the bladder does what every respectable organ would do to, to the growth around it is to get stronger. So it's, it's battling, it's trying to get, like a bodybuilder would, would lift weights the bladder muscle gets thicker and stronger. And so we don't even feel any of the problems that, that, are, that the prostate's causing for years. Then at some time between 40 and 60, we start to realize, hey, a flow is not quite what it's about, what it should have been, or what it was like when we were younger. Maybe it's because some of us have kids and they're, they're standing in the stall next to us. We hear them hitting the toilet and we're saying, wow, what happened to that? <laughs> Something went, went awry along the way. But basically what's happened through, through the years is that the prostate's gotten bigger, the bladder's gotten a little stronger, and then at some point it, it clicks and we finally start feeling that the flow is not really as good as it used to be. Next slide. So when we have this, next slide. When we have this, there's a whole constellation of symptoms that start developing at around age 45 to 50, and even higher than that in, in some lucky, lucky enough men. Uh, there are, and we classify these symptoms as voiding symptoms, which means that there's a slower stream, splitting or spraying, the intermittency where we start and stop the stream, hesitancy and straining to get the urine out. We, there are other symptoms that are related to the bladder wall thickening. And those are the frequency, the urgency 
urgent continence where, where somebody can't hold the urine any longer and, and they, they have an accident. So those storage symptoms are very frequent in, in many of our patients and in the post-maturation symptoms, which is the dribbling and the incomplete emptying. Next slide, please. Potential consequences of this? Well, some men, as they get older, develop urinary tract infections. They develop frank retention in about 15% of the cases where they just can't pee. Something, and that usually is precipitated or heralded by something. Usually they'll tell me they had a couple of drinks, they took a cold remedy, an antihistamine, something that threw the balance between the bladder and the prostate off. Something that relaxed the bladder so it couldn't get the, couldn't push the urine out. And that, and they developed frank urinary retention as a result. In some cases, bladder stones can form, obstruction of the upper tracts, the kidneys, blood in the urine can develop. And, we're, and in the majority of cases, we'll get worse over time. Next slide. So in the past, what we've, uh, what we've done is, well, usually when you go to the urologist's office, you'll fill out a questionnaire. That questionnaire is very, very sensitive to changes in our voiding. And, and so it's usually a, seven, a, a series of seven questions and each one's graded on a, a one to five basis showing the, the symptom severity. And then there's a quality of life score at the end. And these are, this score is extremely helpful for us as urologists in deciding what, to, what our treatment options are available and what we recommend for, for our patients. Next slide. In general, we have a variety of medications which include alpha blockers. This is uh, everything from uh, Hytrin, uh, Flomax, uh, which is Tamsulosin. We have Uroxetrel, which is, which is um, uh, we have Uroxetrel, Psilidocin, whole variety of different alpha blockers which relax the prostate and allow the opening to widen to get, allow the urine to go, to go out easier. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, things like uh, our, um, uh, there, there are two agents out, uh, which, which like finasteride or dutasteride, and what these do is they cause the prostate to shrink over time. Then there are a whole variety of agents that we use for the bladder, anticholinergic agents, and beta-3 agonists, which is the latest, latest group of uh, medications that, that really work on the bladder side of things to reduce some of that frequency and urgency. We recently discovered that Tadalafil, which is Cialis, has significant impact on the prostate as well. And by giving somebody Tadalafil, in, 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 in addition to helping them with their erections, it also seems to help the urinary flow rate. And then there's a whole variety of combination therapies that are available. Next slide, please. Now, these, these medications do a great job for the majority of men for a period of time. And in so, they, it's kind of limited. Some men, again, we, we talked earlier about how men approach their healthcare. Some men are very happy just to get a little bit of improvement where they can get on with their day and not worry about their, their urination. But other men want to get a, a little better. And, uh, and how, how severe the voiding symptoms impact their quality of life is certainly a, 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 uh, an issue. So we have, a, we have a number of surgical therapies that are available. The TURP or the transurethroid section of the prostate is considered still today to be the gold standard. When I was doing my training 25, 30 years ago, this was really the only thing that we had available short of doing an open surgical procedure for larger prostates. This was the only thing that we had available to, to reduce the prostate size. And basically this involves going inside the prostate with a telescope under anesthesia, scraping out the tissue on the inside. I consider the prostate kind of like an orange. You're taking out the meat of the orange, leaving that shell on the outside. It's a highly effective, minimally invasive technique. We talk about minimally invasive, we use that term very loosely in, in, in this time, but that was really the, one of the first minimally invasive oper operations that we did, but we didn't have to make an incision on the outside. Recovery was fairly straightforward and, 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 and fairly rapid. Uh, over the years, there have been tremendous number of improvements in this operation, which we still use today. Next slide, please. Next slide. These are the, this is just a, uh, just a handful of improvements between the devices that we have, the types of fluid irrigations that we have, the various, my, my mentors would look at this like, a, like they're in a candy store looking at this thing because we didn't have this 25, 30 years ago. And it's just tremendous the, the, the number of improvements that have been made and pa the patient's have safety has benefited from this remarkably. We now, I used to, when we used to do these procedures, we'd be really, we, our eye was up to a lens 
But now we're using on the lower hand, lower left of the screen, we're using video cameras now to enlarge and enhance everything. It's all high definition. It's it's a totally different world than it was 25, 30 years ago. And it's and it keeps getting better and better. Next paragraph. Next slide. Primarily as a result of the ejaculation problems with the TRP. So the TRP usually requires an overnight stay. It's it usually doesn't, there, there are very few major complications these days because of the equipment. But some of the things that really disturb some of the men after that procedure are that there's a lack of ejaculation. It doesn't say that they don't orgasm afterwards, but, it, but very little fluid comes out during orgasm. And so that disturbs some men. There's a very small incidence of erection problems afterwards, very small. But as a result of these two specific things, men want to, want to have some options. And so over the last 25, 30 years, there have been a number of options that have, some have come and gone pretty quickly, but we're now using more, increasingly we're using laser procedures now. We're using a variety of different other procedures, which I'll introduce in the next couple of slides in order to avoid some of the ejaculatory difficulties and some of the sexual disorders, and also to enhance, to make the recovery more quick. Uh, more quick. Next paragraph, next uh, slide, please. This is the prosthetic urethral lift or the Urolift. This involves placing small um, uh, implants in the prostate, which pin the prostate open. This has been, uh, it's about seven to eight years old, if not longer at this point. We have some good long-term data of this. And, and it really shows that it preserves sexual function better than most of the other techniques. The, the urinary flow rate after the Urolift it's not quite as good as you do get with the TRP, but there's a, it's a compromise that many men take in order to preserve the ejaculation and the erectile function afterwards. But we do have very good data on this now showing about 20 to 30% retreatment rates at five years afterwards, which for, for the 75 to 80% of men that don't need retreatment, it's great. But there is a, this, the risk of retreatment is certainly a little bit higher with this. Next slide. Next slide. This is something that we're doing here at the University of Miami. This is called Resume. What this is, it's water vapor that when, when you apply steam to the inside of the prostate, this is done with a local anesthetic in the office, just with a little mild sed sedative that's given. Basically, you can apply some steam inside the prostate and it kills the prostate tissue underneath the surface. It takes literally 10 minutes to do the whole procedure. Men are in and out. You do need a catheter for a couple of days afterwards because the prostate does swell, but that tissue sloughs. And it's incredible how, how by doing this, we preserve sexual function completely. Ejaculation is preserved in about 97 to 98% of the cases. And the recovery is pretty quick. Next slide. Green light lasers, a variety of lasers have been used. We have uh, an expert here, world known in our, in our department who does something called homium laser enucleation. And there are a variety of laser technologies that have been used. I, I will say that they are, these are very good procedures. They add a lot to our armamentarium. And for various indications, lasers would be uh, picked over, over the original TURP. Next slide. Prosthetic artery embolization. We have, we have really the home of that here. Um, Dr. Bhatia and, and the in interventional radiology section here at the University of Miami has done a tremendous job at really forwarding this, this technology, where, which is, it doesn't even involve going on the inside of the urinary tract. It's all involving plugging up the blood vessels going to the prostate and causing it to shrink. And it does seem to work very, very well. They have a tremendous amount of experience here. Next slide. And then we have aquablation, which is a, a this technology will be on its way within the next couple of months. What this is, it's, a, it's similar to the TURP, but it's more rapid, a, a quicker recovery from it. It uses a water jet. I didn't realize that water, water jets can be built to cut steel. That's how strong they can, they can, they can, the force of the water can be. And what they do is they basically cut the prostate up to, the, to a contour that you've designed through, with a robot through this console that you can see on the screen there, basically contours the area around the prostate and we tell it where to cut. And, and within 10 minutes, the whole prostate is cut out and, and uh, the patient is on, is on to the recovery room after it's done. And so it works very, very well. And the results are showing that it preserves ejaculation and preserves erectile function better than most of the other technologies that we have. Next slide. So from one option, which was the TURP, 
our armamentarium against BPH in, in the surgical area, surgical arena, has it's expanded tremendously. And these are the latest guidelines. And I'm not going to go through it, but we have indications for using certain technologies for larger prostates and indications for using certain technologies for smaller prostates. Next slide. I did want to discuss a little bit about sexual dysfunction. Um, it, it impacts about 50% of men. Next slide. Men and women both, as they get older, they develop more and more problems with, with sexual activity. Uh, they have very distinct problems. Uh, the, the incidence of, of uh, lack of orgasm in women is about 40%. So that's, that's significant. For men, a lot of the, the sexual disorders that they develop are related to erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation, which is actually the most, uh, most common of all the sexual disorders. Next paragraph, next uh, slide. As a urologist, I look at sexual disorders in four different uh, buckets, really. We have those men with erectile dysfunction, ejaculation and orgasm disorders, loss of libido or desire, and then there are a variety of anatomical dis disturbances, such as Peyronie's disease, which we'll mention. Next slide. So unfortunately, we couldn't see the graph on behind it, but um, basically we know that erectile function goes, the incidence of erectile dysfunction goes up uh, as, as men age. About 50% of men will develop erectile dysfunction between ages 40 and 70. And this goes up significantly as, as men get older. A lot of this is related to diabetes, high blood pressure, previous history of cigarette smoking, a lot of vascular disorders that go in this. And it's, it's important as, as, a, as a society and as a multidisciplinary center, we recognize that this may be a marker for vascular disease in many cases. So that the men who come to us for erectile dysfunction, who have, based upon the, the data we show, showed earlier, a lot of them haven't gone to doctors until the age of 60. Now they have ED, but they, they also have a variety of other underlying problems related to the ED, such as heart disease, which has not been diagnosed yet. Diabetes, we've, we've picked up a number of diabetics in the clinic who came to us for ED. They didn't even know they have diabetes. High blood pressure, uh, smokers, ongoing smoking, things like that, and, and alcohol use. And then we have a whole variety of men who suffer from ED as a result of uh, post-surgical treatments, things like prostate cancer treatment, bladder cancer treatment. Next paragraph, next slide, please. We still have our, these are the, uh, the three major oral therapies. Sildenafil is Viagra, Tadalafil is, is Levitra, and uh, Tadalafil, I'm sorry, is Cialis, and Vardenafil is Levitra. Each has its own various characteristics. Next, next slide. But there are things, many people still don't respond to those. And so we have to go a little bit further. We have injectables, intracavernous injection therapy and transurethral therapy. These are agents that can be injected directly into the penis, but particularly for those men who have post-prostatectomy erectile disorders, where the, the nerves have been injured or, or um, partially injured as a result of the surgery. They, they often, taking a pill doesn't often help them get the erection. So we have to inject an agent directly in the penis in order to get it hard. This works very well, very, very effective. And many of the men are very happy with this. Next slide. And for those men who don't respond to those agents or are not happy with them, we do offer penile prosthetics. So these are devices that can be implanted on the inside of the penis. And basically it, it can inflate and deflate and all you're doing is replacing that mechanism that, that the men can't, men can't get hard. Their sensitivity, their ability to have orgasm, to have ejaculation is all unchanged. All this does is it affords them the opportunity to get hard. We've done a lot of work at our center, in particular in prosthetic urology, to look at how we can enhance the safety in men who've had prostate surgery or bladder cancer surgery. And, and we've developed a whole bunch of different techniques that are right now across the United States, they're, they're basically picking up on these techniques because they're much safer than the existing techniques for, for developing, for putting these devices in. Next slide. We've even gone to the next step. So there's been a change in the paradigm in, in management of ED, so or erectile dysfunction. Typically doctors address or treat symptoms related to that. And we will offer things like lifestyle alteration, psychogenic therapy for those people with mostly psychological problems, the PD-5 inhibitors, the Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, a whole variety of these. They treat the actual disease. But what we've been trying to do lately is trying to repair or replace the diseased tissue. 
somewhat find, finding the fountain of youth for men and changing that tissue so, it, so it's more responsive and it doesn't require therapy. Next slide, please. And one of the things that, that has been found that may be effective in a small population of men is low intensity shockwave therapy. This is a tremendous, tremendously growing area now. There's been a lot of research in, in, in this area. Shockwave therapy, there, there are various types of shockwaves. Um, and you have to be careful because low intensity shockwave therapy re, is, refers to a specific focused wave that, that's made and it's a physics concept. Radio waves and, and focused waves are somewhat dis, different. And the problem is that a lot of the centers in the that are offering this are not offering the focus, the, the low intensity shockwave treatments, which, which really helps, has been found to help in some cases. Next, next slide, please. So as a result of this, there's been a lot, somewhat of an abuse of, of these therapies, these restorative therapies. This and also uh, PRP, which is platelet, uh, plasma platelet-derived therapy, uh, stem cell therapy. There's, there's been a lot of that available out in the community that may not necessarily be uh, standard yet. And it's very costly. You have a very um, a, a community of men who want to, want to gain back their sexuality again, and the appeal is there. And so they're somewhat vulnerable. And so some of the centers are charging a tremendous amount of money to go through these, these therapies. And they're not necessarily, they're, they're not necessarily been, they've not necessarily been proven yet. So the Sexual Medicine Society of North America has actually came out with a, a white, white uh, paper statement saying that they strongly support the development of these things. They don't advocate for restorative therapies to be offered in routine clinical practice, but it should be done under the guise of an IRB or an in, institutional review board so that we should be monitoring this. Next slide. It should be done, there should be research protocols which we have here at, at the University of Miami. We actually have an NIH sponsored uh, research protocol looking at, it's a randomized trial looking at whether um, shockwave therapy helps or not. So this is a very important thing. Men are spending a, a tremendous amount of money on this, and there's no data to support the therapies that they're getting in the community. There's not, there's not a lot of um, uh, um, restrictions on, on, the, on what's given out there. So we have to be a little bit careful with this. Next slide. I'm just gonna to touch on Peyronie's disease. This is something that we're increasingly seeing. Uh, this is a disorder of, where there's penile curvature. Um, it may impact up to 7% of men. We're not really sure what causes it, but we have a variety of different treatments. Next slide, which include in, intralesional injection therapies. We have surgical therapies. A lot of men have been suffering in silence. Finally, testosterone deficiency. These are, I'm just going through these rather quickly. Hopefully we'll get to some of these in the question and answer in session. Testosterone deficiency is something that, that has been considered somewhat of a designer treatment. But, but I will tell you honestly, as men get older, uh, testosterone deficiency becomes increasingly prevalent. The symptoms, which are somewhat nonspecific, like fatigue, weakness, loss of libido, they, they're, they're very nonspecific. But in the right circumstances, in the right patients, when you've excluded some of the other causes of these various things, with, when somebody has low testosterone, you give them back testosterone, it tr there are tremendous benefits from that. Next slide. It's not about creating Bobby Bonds or, or, or Barry Bonds or, or Sammy Sosas. It's really about restoring them to the level of testosterone that they had before their testosterone deficiency developed. And I'm gonna end right there because I think that we're up to about 50 minutes and I do wanna answer some of the questions, but, but I will tell you that from, from various standpoints, um, there, there are clearly disparities in men's health uh, that, and, and areas in men's health that, that, in, that need improvement. I think we have to change the way we approach men's health. We have to capture those men at an earlier age that, that 10 to 60 years old, that group of men needs to see physicians, needs to be counseled, needs to be uh, evaluated a lot earlier in their lives to avoid further downstream problems that, that might result from lack of uh, the healthcare um, that, they, that they see. Dr. Kava, this is absolutely incredibly fascinating that the size safety uh, Institute is just, I mean, you, how blessed are we to have you here? Uh, we have a few questions we want to get to in just a final few minutes. And actually the first one kicks off what you just talked about, the use of testosterone. 
the question goes like this. I'm interested in the pros and cons of the use of testosterone supplements for men as we age past 60 years old. Can you address that? What are the pros and cons? And are there good supplements out there? Because you feel sometimes that there are a lot of charlatans out there. There are. So really testosterone should be delivered in a, in a healthcare environment, in a se healthcare setting. Testosterone, you can't take a testosterone pill. Number one, it doesn't absorb very well. Number two, when it does absorb, because there's a first pass effect that gets absorbed through your stomach, goes right to the liver. And testosterone can be liver toxic, hepatotoxic. So we don't want people taking pills of testosterone. And if you go to your, your, your nutrition stores, things like that, they won't sell you testosterone replacement. They're selling you something to boost your testosterone levels. In all honesty, most of those substances that they have out there don't have any data or valid uh, studies that have shown that they actually impact your serum testosterone levels. So you really should get your testosterone in a, health, in a, a bona fide healthcare environment or setting, such as the University of Miami. There are some, some pros to it. If, um, it does improve vitality. It improves your libido. It improves your your the level for men who are fatigued. It will it'll get rid of that. It, it makes them feel a lot of that. the the um, it's a spirit or, or vitality that, that men get when they're, when they're on testosterone replacement therapy that a lot of it can't, can't even be captured by, by, by talking about it, but they just, they feel it. They feel good about it. Uh, the next question, doctor, is uh, after having an infected penile implant, can I safely have another one put in? Yeah, well, that's, again, that's a, um, so the penile prosthesis, I mentioned it briefly. We do a lot of them here at the University of Miami. We find that it's very helpful. It's, very high patient and, sat and partner satisfaction rates associated with the penile implant surgery. Uh, but on occasion, they get infected. And so that, that we've, there have been a number of um, things that have been done to the device itself to, to prevent infections. But beyond that, there's still about less than 1% of, of the time it will get infected. And when it gets infected, it often has to be removed. We will often try to salvage the situation and put in a new device at that setting. If we can't though, then we have to let things heal and then we come back another day. It's a lot more hard, a lot more difficult to put in a device after, it's, after the penis is healed, after the device has been removed. So there's a lot of scar tissue that develops. But, but again, with the experience that we have here at the University of Miami, we, we do a lot of those. We tackle a lot of those difficult cases. And so we, we, can, we can help you. It's amazing what, we, what we're able to do now. By the way, just in reference to what you talked about earlier in your presentation it was Katie Couric when she was down here, actually when she, her, her husband died of colorectal cancer and she's the one who had her, the, the colonoscopy live. Uh, so the next question here is, are there any advancements in ED since my radical prostatectomy? What I would that say, say is that, that- That was in 2010 that he had that. So what I would say is that, um, that the, the surgeons doing the radical prostatectomy, and I'm one of them, we do our best to preserve the nerves during the surgery. Those nerves allow for, for spontaneous erections to occur. It takes about seven to 10 months after the surgery for those nerves to start transmitting neurotransmitters again. We know that. In many cases, particularly younger patients, the, the nerves will return and you'll get return of sexual, of erectile function. But in many cases, you don't. During the period of time that you're recovering from surgery, often we'll recommend some some type of penile rehabilitation, something that keeps the, the penis working and getting blood flow into it during that period of time to avoid scar tissue to develop, which develops if, if you don't have blood flowing into, you know, blood, oxygenated blood flowing to a tissue. So what we'll, what we'll do is our penile rehabilitation mechanisms have gotten a lot more aggressive lately. We used to just give a Viagra tablet daily and, uh, or, or a Cialis tablet daily to try to improve the blood flow. But now we know that you need to do a little bit more than that. So many of us are starting intracavitous injection therapy earlier to try to get the blood flowing a little bit earlier and try to keep the, keep the tissue healthy so that when the nerves do recover, if they do recover, that the, the penis will be functional. Beyond that, injection therapy and, and penile implants are, are really what, what can help you. Excellent. The next question, actually, you touched on this. A number of these, by the way, they talk about being clairvoyant. I mean, it was like they were listening to what your presentation was going to be. Do you have any thoughts on prostate artery embolization for BPH and how many times can this procedure be uh, repeated? We have actually probably the world's expert here, I think, with, uh, at, at the University of Miami. Um, when he came to me with this idea of, of 
taking a, a catheter, an angio catheter that, that goes into an artery and sending, sending little microscopic beads into the prostate, I, I kind of laughed. I said, what are you talking about? You know, we, we have great, op great options available now. Why would you want to do this? But it turned out that it does work in some, some cases. Now, prostatic artery embolization isn't good for everybody. Um, and Dr. Bonchi has really worked with us very closely. He works with the whole urology department and we work together and collaborate on these patients because there are patients with particularly large prostates tend to do better after the prostatic artery embolization than patients with short, smaller prostates. So that would be a big criteria that I would use. Right. You know, this next question, when you talked about it, I sort of winced and I'm sure all, every other man that was watching this was sort of wincing. So the question goes like this, are injections for ED dangerous? Are they painful? Are they expensive? <laughs> Can you fill in all three? So as far as let's the, the tackle the easiest expense, it's actually cheaper for each injection than it is to take a pill. Um, the, the bottle of the injection therapy it's usually, it's a, we use Trimix here at the University of Miami. Often uh, um, Caberjet or Edex are used. Those are brand name products. And we can get them. Usually it, it turns out to be about 100 to $150 for a bottle of this, which will last generally about two or three months for most of our patients. So on an individual basis for each injection, and each, of, each of these bottles will hold maybe 30 injections in them. So it, it's actually not too expensive. Um, there are some places on the outside that you can get it, which are a little more costly and that's where they make their money. But, but we don't, we don't try to profit on this. This is something that's very basic. We think, um, as far as the, the danger goes, the major danger with the injection therapy is that the erection on occasion can last too long. That's called priapism. So it, it's a very effective way of getting blood flow into the penis, but on occasion it'll last more than an hour or two. And beyond that point, three or four hours later, it's no longer fun having an erection. And in fact, it starts to hurt. So we, all, we teach people, and we, we take this very seriously, we teach them how to induce detumescence or give an agent that brings down the penis after, after a period of time. That's, that's, um, so it can be dangerous if it's left hard for more, more than six to eight hours or, or even more. We've had patients come in three to four days later and they're still erect. That's a terrible situation. That, that can cause the damage. Yeah, well, th that begs the question then, how often do you need these injections? Uh, well, unfortunately, for, for many people, these injections are used for, for each sexual ex encounter that you have. So you, you do it right at the time of, of uh, you know, you're engaging in some foreplay, you inject yourself, and you, you get an erection there. So it has to be used every time you have sex. Got it. Our next question is, what alternatives to injection exist when Cialis and or Viagra are ineffective? Transurethral therapy was, was, uh, had a little, um, transurethral therapy, Muse is the name of the drug. Uh, it was being used in the late 1990s. Um, it's very difficult to get it. It's very expensive. And uh, we've had a lot of difficulties with it. There, there aren't many compounding pharmacies that make this agent. It's really a patent that, uh, that the company had developed for, it's a suppository that goes in the urethra. So that's one option. The other option that people have are um, vacuum devices, which is not particularly effective for most people. Most people just don't find those very good quality rigid erections. Um, so penile implant surgery is really where a lot of people will go after, after they fail the injectables. Can you address uh, our next question? Can you address BPH treatment with finasteride and to, uh, what is it, temozolosin? Right, so temozolosin, I mentioned before that there were various classes of drugs that are used to treat uh, that are used to treat BPH. The alpha blockers or alpha adrenergic blocking agents such as tamzolosin, which is Flomax, um, uroxetral, um, and uh, which is alfuzosin, and, and psilocybin. Uh, uh, these are these are agents which actually relax the prostate. They they improve the flow rates. They reduce the residual urine in the bladder after somebody voids, and they improve symptom scores to a degree. Again, I mentioned before that it's not a true, if you look at the symptom scores after starting one of these agents, it changes by maybe about four or five points. When you do a TRP on somebody, it changes by up to 10 or 20 points. So you get a better effect from the surgical therapy, but for most people, this four or five point change in the symptom score is just enough to get them by and, and, and not have to worry about voiding. Finasteride is another agent, doesn't change the symptom scores very much. It reduces the prostate size. 
it tends to work over time. For people with larger prostates, we, we will sometimes offer finasteride to prevent problems later from developing enlarging prostates and from developing bleeding, things like that. But finasteride isn't used as much as it used to be. Right. You talked about this, and maybe you can just quickly go through it one more time. The, the, question wanted to, the, the questionnaire wanted to know about the Eurolift, which you talked about, and how effective it really is. Uh, Eurolift is good for people with smaller prostates who don't have what's called a median lobe. There's, there's prostate, prostate grows laterally and also from the bottom when it grows in, inside and it obstructs the urine. This bottom growth is often a major problem for many men. And when you have with, with the Eurolift, it really addresses the lateral lobes. Uh, and what I would say is that most of the data support that it does improve symptom scores. It does improve the urinary flow rates, but it's also rather limited, not tremendous, not like a TURP, not like, and, and if you look really at, at the resume versus Eurolift, I don't think that they've done any major head to head trials with that, but I think that we could do better than the Eurolift usually. Right. Uh, this came into us for men who have had a radical prostatectomy. What alternatives are on the medical research horizon within the next five years, doctor, beyond the current alternatives that we have, which include the penal implant? Down the road, um, I'm, I'm at a I'm at a standstill right now. We're, we're looking at a variety of different options. We're looking at better nerve preservation, better surgical options. Uh, ways to identify the nerves a little bit better, ways to identify the blood vessels that surround the prostate better. So right now, I don't think that there's anything really in the pipeline that's, uh, that's, that's you know, people have looked at stem cell therapy and there, there's some studies being done with that. Amniotic fluid, amniotic membrane wrap around the blood vessels in order, and blood vessels in the nerves in order to help it regenerate afterwards. These are things that people are toying with right now, but there, there's right now, we're, we're, there's, there's not a lot out there yet. Right. I'm having an MRI of my prostate on Wednesday, the, the question goes. I'm having a lack of sexual interest and function, starting testosterone gel I am right now, and worried about the effect on PSA increase. Is there a reason for me to be concerned about it? So the data on testosterone, that's, I didn't mention this before, and uh, we just didn't have time because it's a highly controversial area. If you speak to old school, the old school thought was that testosterone causes or exacerbates prostate cancer. If you have prostate cancer, the old, the old theories went that if you give testosterone to somebody with this, it'll make it grow faster or it'll make it uh, more aggressive. Turns out that it's probably not the case. Many of us are using testosterone replacement therapy to treat people with low testosterone who have prostate cancer, particularly earlier prostate cancer, either they are on active surveillance where they're not being treated aggressively or they've had their prostates removed and they don't no longer have cancer. And so many of us are starting to use it under these circumstances. And, and most of the data from the literature support that this is very safe. But again, using this with a, with a doctor who's experienced in this area is, is really important because you don't, wanna, you don't wanna be treated inappropriately with testosterone replacement therapy. Uh, great, it's, it's great to know. Uh, and I'm sure that gentleman is, is very, uh, very glad to hear that as well. Uh, our last question is, other than constant monitoring, are there foods or meds that can help control prostate cancer? Now, what, I want to add something here that I, I, I'm not sure a lot of men who grow older understand and know, but I know that our protein needs as we get older become a lot more paramount, uh, that you talk a lot about metabolism in the older people, but it's, it's really what they need more protein than they thought they did. So can you address that question and then uh, with the protein part of it as well? The, the data on food and prostate cancer is very soft data. It's not, there's not a lot of good, strong evidence to, to show that, um, to, to look at individualized food groups. We do know that the incidence of prostate cancer is very, was very low in the Asian communities. And we, we attributed that to, um, to the, the diet that they had. And we found that if you look at migration studies, incidence of prostate cancer in Asians as they moved to the San Francisco Bay Area went up with each consecutive generation, we think as a result of eating more fat in their, in their diets. So when I was up at, uh, when I was doing my fellowship up at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we were doing some laboratory studies with rats. We deprived them of, of various fat, low fat diets and high fat diet. And we had implanted 
uh, prostate cancer in their, in their sides and measured the tumor growth. And it turns out that the fat in the, in the diet actually contributes to the growth of the, of the tumor cells. So we think that cutting a lot of the fat out of the diet, eating a more Mediterranean oriented diet is probably very helpful. It, whether you have prostate cancer, but it's also heart healthy as well. And there are a bunch of people in the field who are looking at these issues right now and designing studies and clinical trials, which are quite difficult to do. Diet, diet studies are very difficult to do in medicine. And there's a lot of things because controlling what somebody eats is, is very difficult. So I don't think that there's any really strong data out there, but we have a lot of indirect evidence showing the, the link. Dr. Cobb, are you tired? You just went, you just flew through this hour plus time that we have. I'm sure that there are a lot more questions that men want to ask. I know that there's about 20 more that I want to ask that I didn't, didn't even get a chance to throw okay, at. Ask me to talk about men's health topics. I just, I just there's so many things to discuss, but, well, but it's that, true. That's, that's the beauty of this field. It really is. Yeah, it's not only that, you're just so passionate about it. And, and uh, the, the, the size SETI Institute is very blessed and very fortunate to have you and your team. So we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm honored. Yeah, it, we were honored. It was great to have you. Our program has come to an end, regrettably, and we didn't have time to address all of your excellent questions, but I would like to close by saying we'd like to thank you for staying with us. I know a number of you did, and especially thank you to Dr. Kava. He's a busy man. I swear, I don't know when he has time to sleep. <laughs> we the, I, I don't I, I don't and can, let me I, I know we're running out of time do you sleep well <laughs> I was like that was a picture of me that that guy laying in his bed thinking yeah about <laughs> yeah I, I was thinking that that was really it wasn't Mervin like you said it was <laughs> it looked like George Costanza that's what I thought <laughs> yeah there you go there you go serenity now serenity now happy festivus doctor we Thank have you. Yeah, the size <laughs> sexy urology institute and the University of Miami Health System. We cannot tell you how much we appreciate your participation and invite you to visit umiamihealth.org for more information. Or again, as I said earlier in the program, if you're old school, you can just pick up the phone and call them at 305-243-6090 to make an appointment. We hope you enjoyed tonight's U, U Miami Health Talk and encourage you to complete the survey at the end of this talk. You know what this survey does? It takes you about 30 seconds, not even that, to do this. It provides us feedback on your experience tonight, and it helps us to understand maybe you can suggest some other topics that you would be interested in. And as a result, we will listen to those surveys and provide more information and webinars that will fit your needs. From all of us at the University of Miami and U Health, we wish you nothing but good health. Please stay safe. And remember, it's always about the you. Good night, everybody. Have a great night.